This is the Gambling Gauchos. Welcome to the Gambling Gauchos. I'm Rob Rowe. He's Kyle Jacobson. Professional. Gentlemen. Recording live in the Cardinal Sports Center studio. Uh, today is the final day of the sidewalk sale. It was amazing. I know you stopped by. Mm-hmm. I went and bought nine hats. I almost bought three pairs of shoes, but I didn't. Uh, looked through all the tech shirts. They had some really cool tech shirts. Everything was 50% off. It's one of my favorite uh, things to do every year. So shout out to Cardinals. It looked like a really, really good success. Lots of uh, fun. Um, food trucks and aqua fresca and all that kind of stuff out there as well. So I know they really enjoy that. I'm sure they also enjoy when it's over because it must be brutal (laughs) to stand outside in a hundred degree weather on the blacktop for three or four straight days. Yeah. I saw some gear when I was there. Um, Of course I've got Texas tech gear, but even some with like our, future big 12 rivals logos on it uh saw some oregon polos things like that so future big 12 rivals yeah um so you can go to cardinals local or in plano or find them online mycardinalsports.com um do you want to just like in 30 seconds break down what's happened in realignment since the last time we talked so we don't have to like spend a bunch of time on it because it's like nothing big but some small things have happened yeah i mean i think the 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 main thing so when usc and ucla first bolted everybody sort of agreed that notre dame was the next domino to fall and if they went big 10 then big 10 would probably need one more to pair them up with um all accounts right now are that notre dame is going to stand pat for now they don't need to rush into a decision. You know, the big 10 would take them in a year in five years in 10 years. I'm sure whenever Notre Dame tells any conference that it wants to join that conference will accommodate. Um, So with that sounds like Oregon and Washington are on standby at best. They may never get invited to the big 10, but certainly not right now. Right now. Yeah, no. So I think now the next domino is what, what does the pac 10 do? Um, they seem to be in the denial phase right now. And they're like, oh, well, what if we merge with the ACC or partner with the ACC? And I think best case scenario, if they pull off a partnership for the next two years, okay, fine. But then who is the ACC going to partner with? Because the PAC-10 will not exist until they renew their grant of rights, which once they try to do that, they'll realize that they're not going to get as much money as they would in the new Big 12. So they can slap a Band-Aid on it, maybe, for the next two years and partner with the ACC, although you and I have been told that that is dead in the water, and there's been some reporting out there that there might be interest from that from the PACs side in that arrangement, but nobody in the ACC is fired up about that. Well, so I think The fact that, that it has to be a loose agreement and not a written agreement. Right. Because if it's written, it breaks the grant of rights for the ACC, and they can leave without a buyout. Right, and ESPN does not want that because right now they're paying Clemson half of their market value, um, right. if that. So I think that folks in the Pac-10 hopefully are realizing that, okay, we went through denial, and the reality is that we're not going to survive as the Pac-10. Maybe for two years, but after that, we're still not going to. So I see it as – I've gone for longer than 30 seconds, but – it takes one team to flinch. And if Arizona or Colorado says, you know what, Oregon and Washington have one foot out the door, this ACC thing is stupid, yeah. and they apply for Big 12 membership, then the rest of the four corners, I think, will. Um, so I think hopefully you've got a feasible path to becoming a 16-team conference. If Oregon and Washington want to join and make it 18, great. And then you just wait for the ACC to blow up. And when the SEC and Big 10 take two, four, or six – then you swoop in and get Virginia Tech, NC State, Louisville, and and the U if you can. If not, then you take Pitt or Georgia Tech or whoever. It's all about the U. Yeah, so I mean, I think right now the main thing, and if teams like, or if programs like Texas Tech and Arizona and Kansas and NC State were smart, they would say, we need to do whatever we can 
to form a viable third power conference yeah. that has a seat at the table in the playoff. Because if everybody is this selfish, then it's just going to be the power two, and we're all going to get left out. Yeah, one hundred percent. The fact is, there are going to be casualties. You know, if if the ACC implodes, Wake Forest is not going to have a dancing partner. Oregon State and Wazoo are probably left out in the cold, but I would hate to see an entire third of the Power Five not even be invited to the party. And of course, I'm that's because I'm a Texas Tech fan, and you're not going to the SEC or the Big Ten. But I would right. hate it for all the other programs too. Like the sport is more fun when Gundy has a shot at the playoffs or when Virginia Tech under Frank Beamer had a shot at the national title. Programs like that had a chance. Yeah. So I'm hoping. Joey, yeah. <laughs> so I'm hoping that there's a viable third conference that forms. And to me, I think the Big 12 is in a good spot. If you take yeah. the PAC's yes. leftovers and then you get the ACC's leftovers, you're that clear number three. When I still think because the ACC has until 2036, if they can hold on, um, I still see a four-team – or a four conference setup. I mean, I don't, I don't think that's out of the realm, realm of possibility. <laughs> you don't think that's out of the realm of possibility, Paul? Uh, no, you're right though. I don't, though. I don't think it is. So two so major leagues, four, two minor leagues, kind of. Yeah, yeah and the, the ACC and the SEC are, you know, nutted together because the ESPN and then CBS, NBC, and Fox take the rest, and and you do it, you do it that way. Especially if, and I don't. No, if I'm not a fan of this, I don't know if this is sustainable long term. But if Notre Dame just can't get over, you know, being independent and a quasi ACC member, but if the ACC makes concessions and Notre get, Notre Dame gets paid, and the ACC makes concessions to Clemson and Florida State and says y'all get same amount as everybody else plus twenty percent, maybe right. that's enough to hold it together. Because I again, I do think, uh, do I think Dabo could compete in the SEC? Yeah. Do I think he'd rather run the table in the ACC than go grind it out against LSU and Bama every year? Well, here's yeah. the problem, too. What if Dabo is Nick Saban's successor? That's a good point. Is Clemson Clemson without Dabo? They could be. I think he should that. Right. But they, they won a national title in 1980, and they are geographically situated in a place where they can recruit with anybody. Right. Um, and again, yeah. do you want to go be the sixth best team in the SEC or do you want to stay number one in the ACC? Right. Because I, I get the TV dollars argument and I know that that rules everything. But again, if that's my whole thing to- with that's my whole thing with Texas Tech, too. It's like people are like, oh, well, are we joining the Big Ten or the SEC? Uh, neither for one. For two, like, yes, I understand the money's better. But I would rather be, you know, perennial fourth place, punching up at first in the Big 12 when Joey has it rolling than perennial eighth, punching up at fifth in the SEC, which I I mean, I don't want to be like Debbie Downer here, but I just feel like that's where you are. No, you, or you're be. absolutely right. I mean, if you look at the that's best That's where you've been seasons, in the Big 12. If you look at the best seasons in program history – for Ole Miss, Kentucky, Arkansas, you know, schools like that. Yeah. Uh, in the SEC, at least. You look at the best they've ever done. It, it's not Alabama's ceiling or LSU ceiling. So right, they're like third in the West. Yeah. You can go have the best team Texas Tech has ever had, go 10 and two, and finish third place in your division. Yeah. And like you might get to play for a New Year's Six Bowl, or you can win the ACC, win the Big 16, whatever it becomes. And be playing in the playoff and have a conference title band. Okay. Let's go in the future, Kyle. Mm -hmm. Because we've been doing a lot of speculating. And frankly, I'm tired of this speculating. And I want to do some long-term speculating. Okay. But do you know what the Pac-12 could do to save their conference? They could get a, a payday loan from a program or a company like Diversified Lenders. Did you see... They could rent some uh, construction equipment or or whatever else to keep their Pac-12 afloat. So we will get to this ad read, but did you see (laughs) the article that came out that under Larry Scott, they wanted to, he wanted to sell a $1 billion equity stake in the Pac-12 and they said no? Yeah. 
I wonder, I, I can't remember if I brought this up on the podcast or just in conversation with you, but I've wondered about like naming rights for a conference. Yeah. Like the, the, the AT&T big 12. Yeah. yeah. The, the, the Southwest airlines, big 12, the, the Amazon, amazon.com big 12 Nike. If Oregon does come and they want to make the most of this, how much but I if, still, th- I mean, I think Oregon, I think Nike just wants to help Oregon and not the conference. Right. Cause why didn't he, one why didn't he ever do that? with the He didn't need to. I guess, yeah. But anyway, you know, if it's all about, (laughs) yeah, he does now. (laughs) Um, If it's all about per school payout and you're not going to catch up in TV dollars, why not? People are like, oh, well, it cheapens the. It's like, okay, well, there's there's an official pizza of the NFL. Yeah. uh, In NASCAR, right now it's just called uh, Cup Series, but it used to be the Nextel Cup, the Winston Cup. What would that deal be for? Would it be you know seventy two million and everybody gets an extra four? Once you're to 16, or would it be a hundred million and you kind of break it up? I don't depending think that on math checks out, but four times 16 is 72. No, <laughs> I think it's 64, right? Yeah, that's what I said. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah, I mean, like, hey, if you're if you're 20 million behind and you would I say 72? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> if, you're, if you're 20 million behind and you could close that to 12 million through yeah. na- naming rights and tier three and pay per view. Yeah. Why not? Why not? Uh, yeah, and and that's the difference between what twenty eight or thirty two, yeah, or thirty eight and forty two. Yeah, I mean it, that's it, a that's a big difference on paper. You have to be creative if you're if you're in the spot the Big Twelve. If that's playing more conference games, if that's an yeah. alliance with other Power Five teams in the non con, and if, could if, you could you get it to eight per team? If it was the Big 12 or the Big 16 or whatever you want to call it, and then it's the Amazon division and the Nike division instead of instead of the East the, and the West. The the Big 12 championship game is already the Dr. Pepper Big 12 championship yeah. game. The conference tournament is Phillips 66 in basketball. It, NBA franchises have McDonald's on their jerseys now or whatever. Yeah. yeah. So it's the, it's the same thing. You're, you're going Why toward not? that. Yeah. If you're now – would a Bob Bowlesby type of a lifelong bureaucrat of the system go for that? No, but that's why you hired Brett Yormark, right? To be creative, yeah. innovative, new, fresh. I don't know if he'll go that route or not, but I feel like it should be on the table. Yeah. So yeah, maybe you become what, the what does that hurt? You could say right. it hurts the, it cheapens the image, but you're already, if you're number three out of three, then, yeah. you know, you're not, you're not going to catch the SEC in the Big Ten at this point. So you have to maximize thought, your Yeah, program. I thought our whole thing in the last three weeks is that money talks. Mm-hmm. Right? Exactly. That's, that's money talking. <laughs> yeah. And, and I know people threw a fit, like you said, with the NBA. And like, okay, it says Fitbit on your shoulder now. Yeah. You it's like, oh, it. what is, it's, it's second nature now. Nobody notices or, or cares. And, and if it's the Nike conference, you know, just put everybody in Nike. Yeah. I mean, that's the perk. So, yeah, maybe you become the Diversified Lenders Big 12 Conference. Diversifiedlenders.com. Check them out. Red Raider owned and operated. Get you to the next uh, level there. All right. So let's go into the future. Now, I did say we're going to look at your conference first. Or we can go mine first or whatever. But yours is interesting. But let me set it up. Let me set it up first. Basically, we're going Mad Max here. Uh, everything is blown up. The NCAA is dead. It's, I don't know, 2038. The ACC has uh, renewed. The, the SEC and the, the Big Ten have been broken off for a decade, and it didn't work. They couldn't compete with the NFL. They're coming back to the rest of the leagues, and they say, all right, ACC, okay, Big 12, Everybody picks 16 teams, and we're going to do what the NFL does and collective bargain between the four of us with ABC, Fox, CBS, and have a collective bargained TV contract, split the money four ways, and all move forward. Okay. Mm-hmm. And basically, you get to fantasy draft your 16 teams for your conference. Everybody's getting the same money. It doesn't matter. 
you can pick your 16 teams. It's 2040 or whatever it is. Do you want to go first or do you want me to go first? I'll go first because I feel like okay. yours is probably the route more people would go. Okay. And so I'll need to, I'll need to good, justify mine. That's a good way to put it. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, I'll preface it by saying, yeah, I didn't feel the need to go for a ton of big markets or blue bloods or anything because we're getting the same amount of money anyway. Right. Um, I prioritized geography and history. And so I've got some old big 12 in here slash big eight, some Southwest conference and border conference. Here's my 16. I'll start in the state of Texas, Texas tech, Texas, Texas A&M Baylor, TCU, SMU, and UTEP. Uh, Branching out a little bit, the border conference teams that I would like to add are New Mexico, Arizona, and Arizona State. Um, Not as regional for the rest of the conference, but for West Texas, I feel like those fit the regional culture pretty well. Sure. And then I think the rest are all Big 8 slash Big 12 type members. Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, Kansas, Kansas State, Nebraska, Iowa State. Yeah. And I fully recognize that I could have put Arkansas or LSU in instead of UTEP, New Mexico, or even SMU. But like I said, I wanted wanted a strong presence in the state of Texas. I wanted this to be like absolutely hands down the Texas conference, like the Southwest Conference was, but also have broader regional appeal and keep some you of could those have, could rivalries. Have Houston, Houston instead of UTEP. No, I don't want Houston instead of UTEP. Okay. Okay. Um, have you ever been to the Sun Bowl, Rob? Yeah. Historic stadium, yeah. beautiful stadium. Very nice. Um, also, I'll get this out there. I wanted uh, wanted there to be some bottom feeders. I I get that in this super conference era that we're in, you know, USC and Notre Dame are going to finish in the middle of the pack. I don't want that. I don't want Texas Tech to have to have their greatest season ever to finish in fifth out of sixteen teams. So I want Kansas and New Mexico and UTEP and SMU on the schedule for easy dubs yeah. so that Texas is considered middle of the pack in an average year and can feasibly punch their way up to the top of the conference. Here's my issue with how I set it up in your conference. Okay. If you're going for 16 team leagues, who are you demoting to pull up SMU who are you demoting to pull up UTEP and New Mexico? Because that's the current power five is 64, right? Uh huh. Well, now it's like 69 with Notre Dame and uh, the four you just brought up, Houston and BYU and them. But like um, I'll SMU, UTEP, you. New Mexico, like Maryland, uh, Rutgers, that kind of stuff. Yeah, Oregon State, Wazoo, Purdue, Northwestern, yeah. Wake Forest. I mean, yeah, cool. I mean, I get it. Like Northwestern can go to the Ivy League. Stanford can go to the Ivy League. Yeah. It's not feasible. Like, yeah, they wouldn't make the cut. You know, you're not going to have seven power five schools from one state. Right. Uh, So if I was being a little more realistic, maybe drop UTEP, New Mexico, maybe shift Iowa State to the Big Ten so they can be with Iowa. Yeah. And then I would add uh, probably Colorado and Arkansas. It would probably be the the two. If, If it was a little more realistic. Yeah. I mean, we're doing dream world stuff, so I, you don't have yeah. to be realistic. You don't want to. And I know I'm in the minority. Nobody cares about the border conference as much as I do. Like, I'm in the top 1% of border conference appreciators. Yeah. People there was that one nose. guy on Twitter. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, I want to, you know, I want to play in El Paso in New Mexico. That's, that's West Texas, you know. New Mexico is West Texas. Eastern New Mexico is certainly West Texas. Yeah. Uh, all right. Here's my 10. Sorry, 16. Sorry. I cannot do numbers today, apparently. <laughs> I moved a lot of furniture this morning. Uh, so starting with Texas Tech, I'm going to go Texas Tech, TCU, Baylor, Texas, Texas A&M. Those are my Texas schools. I did have Houston in, but I'll tell you why I took them out in a second. And then I'm going to go Oklahoma State, Oklahoma. Then I'm going to tear up the SEC West a little bit. Ole Miss, Mississippi State, Arkansas. And then I've just been really excited. Oh, and LSU. And I've just been really excited about 
the border conference. So Arizona, Arizona State. I would bring back Nebraska, which is why I booted Houston to get Nebraska back. And then I'm adding the Holy War in, BYU, Utah. That's a good pairing. To pair with Arizona, Arizona State. Can you imagine? Okay, this conference, the conference that you've created, yeah. would have to have the widest disparity in tailgate scenes. Oh, my gosh. Provo <laughs> and Oxford. Like and Baton Rouge. <laughs> yeah, so like geographically, not only are those the corners of the yeah. conference, but also the ends yeah. of the spectrum on tailgating. Yeah. I mean, could you imagine going back-to-back weeks to – Oxnard and then <laughs> Baton Rouge and then to yeah. to Pro- Provo. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, so the, the 16 straight down because I said I'm all weird. Uh, Texas Tech, TCU, Baylor, Oklahoma State, LSU, BYU, Arizona, Arizona State, Utah, Nebraska, Arkansas, A&M, Texas, Oklahoma, Ole Miss, Mississippi State. And again, I've, I've put in BYU instead of somebody, but – and even if it was 18 or 20 and you got to 72 or 80, um, I think there's room, especially if you're ending up collectively bargaining, um, which that would admit failure from the SEC and the Big Ten. But I just don't see the pace you're going on working out. Uh, yeah, I, I've got my doubts. Um, I do think, so, though, the conferences you and I created – are somewhat similar. We both have a lot of um, yeah. original Big 12 plus the Arizonas. I just went like SEC West instead of Conference USA. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I think that I think both of our conferences would put Texas Tech in the middle tier, hopefully. Like you'd have UT, OU, Nebraska, and A&M kind of as the top dogs. Yours would have LSU. Mine does not. And then mine has a pretty clear bottom feeders, UTEP, New Mexico, Kansas, yep. Iowa State without Matt Campbell. And then Tech would be right there in the middle with Oklahoma State, uh, pre-Gundy, uh, Kansas State, at the Arizonas. So I, I like both of them, honestly. I, yours was a little bit top-heavy for my liking, which is why I looped in some border right. conference bottom feeders. But it's a bit of I, a I, I shot at Iowa State. I mean, they're – they're really bad without Matt Campbell. <laughs> like really bad. Uh, that's awesome. Not, yeah. I'm not um, a cyclone state or anything, but making noises over here. So I'm sure your conference will win, but we can pulse the people posted. I'll make the graphics for both of our conferences and see which one people would rather play in, but I'm going to wait until we give them a chance to listen to this episode so they can hear our justification in case that moves the needle at all. But I think you'll win. Okay. <laughs> All right. Because if I was going to go your route, I would have just said USC, Notre Dame, Ohio State, Alabama. Yeah. But yeah, I don't want to do well, that. I, 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 see, I wouldn't want to put Texas Tech in with all those schools. Um, even like Alabama. Because if you're going to get this, if you're going to get the same money, if it's going to be collectively bargained, and even if even if two leagues still got more money, but you were there and it was collectively bargained between you know a, a sitting chair and the Big Ten and the SEC get a bigger cut than the ACC and the Big Twelve or whatever, I still think you just you would want to evenly split the leagues, which maybe mine is a little top heavy if you're trying to evenly split. Um, so maybe it's like a Kentucky comes over or. Something, but even in mine, Arizona, Arizona State, I think would settle toward the bottom in football. Uh, Nebraska obviously has all the history, but haven't been able to put it together. I think Arkansas, Mississippi, and Mississippi State are all so similar to Texas Tech and Baylor as far as like ceiling floor that it would just be some really interesting up and downs there. Um, and then the Utah, I, I think, is going to get a rude awakening once they get into a real conference because they've never been in a Power 5 conference before. Facts. <laughs> well, they're too good for a Power 5 conference. Maybe that's why. Right, right. Yeah, because they're murdering the Pac-12, so they think they belong in the SEC. Harsh realities await. Regino Barbecue is named one of the top 50 barbecue joints in the state of Texas. As you know, Rob – 
based in one of the top five cities in West Texas, Olton. Uh, it was recently, recently named, named. Yeah. Recently named that by who? Us. Using what criteria? The world may never know. Um, you can make the 45-minute drive out to Olton from Lubbock or Amarillo, but you can also catch their mobile truck going all around West Texas. Follow them on social media at Rahino BBQ. Find out where the truck is going. Check out what they're smoking that day. Uh, some nice-looking poppers, burgers, ribs, all that stuff on their Instagram. And a good follow on Twitter as well. So check out our friends over at Rahino Barbecue. What uh, football games did you watch this week? I started to rewatch. I'll, I'll keep kind of watching some Big 12 classics. The only one I've seen so far, well, I watched 2012 Texas Tech versus TCU earlier this summer. Oof. And then I, I watched um, 2007 Kansas versus Mizzou at Arrowhead Stadium. Uh, Kansas was ranked number two in the country. Mizzou was ranked number four. They were playing for the Big 12 North title. And uh, number one LSU had lost earlier that day week on Friday night to Arkansas in triple overtime. And so it was presumed that the winner of that game would go to the Big 12 championship game. And if they could beat OU in the Big 12 title game would uh, go to the national championship. Missouri won the game. Uh, Kansas scored on their last four possessions. Had they woken up a little bit earlier, Kansas probably would have won the game. But great atmosphere there. I think there was 80 plus thousand folks at Arrowhead for the border war. That was the first time they had played it at a neutral side, at least in a long time. It, it was a home and home before that. Bring that back. Yeah. So some names folks might remember: Akib Talib was KU's corner, um, Todd Reesing, Chase Daniel, Chase Kaufman from Mizzou, Jeremy Macklin, some uh, all-time Big Twelvers there. Was uh, Chris Harris Jr. there too, or was he just younger than Akib Talib? Mm-hmm. I don't know. That's a good question. He might have been just younger. And for college football fans, you might remember 2007 was like the craziest season ever. Like the the yes. number of times yeah. that number one and number two lost in the same week. So, like I said, those two teams were two and four. West Virginia was three. They were about to lose to Pitt in their last game. So West Virginia basically had a path to the national title and blew it. LSU was ranked number one, was handed their second loss of the season, fell back to number four, I think, but moved up to number two because of the movement in front of them. And so two loss LSU made the national championship game, I believe against Ohio state that year and uh, won the national title with two losses. I think that was Matt Flynn. So just a wild year. Yeah. So like the last week of the season, Kansas, West Virginia, and Mizzou all had a very clear path to the national title game and none of them made it. Amazing. And then 2008 was almost as cool. Yeah, you had four of the best 10 teams in the country all in the same division, the Big 12 South. Yeah. Um, and that did not go well for – wait, who yeah. was number four? Oklahoma State. Oh. They, they, okay. they were, I think, ranked as high as number seven at one point that year. Were they? Yeah. Zach Robinson and yeah. all those guys. Um, and then in, in the north, you still had – so Mizzou and KU were coming off this year where they were both top five teams. You still had Nebraska, Kansas State. Uh, of course, that was the Ron Prince. Well, 2008. Era, so. Is that when Kansas went to the Orange Bowl? No, that was 07. Is that 2009? Oh, that was 07. They played it in 08. That's what it was. Yeah, so it actually worked yeah, out better yeah. for Kansas because uh, – Right. They got, Mizzou, they got it in and then, yeah. Yeah, Mizzou lost to Oklahoma, and Mizzou got bounced from the BCS picture because they had two losses at that point. Uh, Kansas kind of backs their way into the Orange Bowl, and Oklahoma oh, – They think, won the Orange Bowl, didn't they? Yeah, but I'm saying they lost their last game of the season right. and didn't have to play the Big 12 title game, which if they had, right, gotcha. they might have been passed over if they had lost to OU. Fair enough. And I think that was the Boise State OU Fiesta Bowl. I think that yeah. was the same year. Yeah, with oh. uh, the, the Statue of Liberty. Yeah. What was that guy's name? Jared Zabransky was the quarterback. That sounds or, right. Ian Johnson the running back. was a running back. Oh, yeah. I was thinking – I was thinking Lane Johnson, but I didn't want to say that because that's tackle for the Eagles. Yeah. Ian Johnson. So anyway, wild football season. But yeah, I'm gonna I got that's a awesome. ton of submissions from fans all around the Big 12. Yeah. Uh, like a hundred comments. I'm gonna have yeah. to go back and watch some of those too. Yeah, so I'll try to find like the hour, hour and a half versions on YouTube. I'm surprised you went uh pre-2008. <laughs> yeah. 
Now I'm going to watch some classics that involve teams no longer in the conference. Okay, all right. Some future conference teams, maybe. Yeah. I also wanted to ask you about this start bench cut you did this afternoon. Yeah, tough one. Um, do you did you have an answer before you put that, or are you just kind of lobbing bombs and running away? No, no. That's why I I didn't <laughs> give my two cents because I don't know how I would answer it. Um, and I've got I've got mine. Okay. Assuming. Assuming a good defense, and then just like the average receivers that Tech has had, is that what we're saying? Sure. Or can I like? Uh, how about I'll doctor, phrase it this way: doctor no, and offense. I'll phrase it this way: this season, if you could bring any of those quarterbacks to this season's okay. team okay. to play in the years that I specified: oh three BJ Simmons, oh seven Graham Harrell, okay, okay, twenty sixteen okay. Pat Mahomes. Which quarterback would you want leading the team this year? This season. Mm. Well, that makes it even harder. Because <laughs> there's essentially three schools of thought. Yeah. Mahomes is the most talented, yes. no doubt. Uh, Harrell had the most accomplishments. He won better yes. than the other two in college. When he had and three full seasons. B.J. Simmons had the best statistical season of the three. That's not true. Graham Harrell... True. Graham Harrell actually had the best statistical season in 2007. Uh, no, because Bailey Zappi just broke B.J. Simmons' records, not Graham Harrell's records. <laughs> okay. I mean, I can pull it up real quick if you want me to. Yeah, well... Because uh, it'll be good for our listeners to hear. Too. I would be arguing numbers. Um, I'm going to pull up the numbers and we'll, we can debate it. Okay. But that's kind of depending on yes. which of those three factors people Indiv- value most. individual records. BJ, sheer talent, eye test, Mahomes, team success, and uh, individual success as well. Graham Harrell. He also had three seasons, and the other two had two okay. and a half and one. So here's the single season yardage records. BJ Simmons is number one in school history with 5,800 in 2003. Yeah. Um, Graham Harrell is 128 yards behind him, 5,700 in 2007. Right. So, yardage wise, they're essentially neck and neck. Um, Single season passing touchdowns, again, it's very close. BJ Simmons, 52 in 2003. Graham Harrell had 48 in 2007. Yes. I would also note BJ Simmons played the vast majority of that season on a torn ACL. 100%. B.J. Simmons also in 2003. And that was Graham Harrell's second year as a starter. Correct. Also has the single game touchdown record for Texas Tech with eight in 03. He's also tied for second with seven in 2003. Yeah. So he had some monster games, of course. Yeah, B.J. Here's why I say that I I prefer Graham's single season to B.J.'s, even though B.J. had 52 touchdowns and 5,800 yards. You ready? Okay. Yeah. B.J. Through 719 times yeah. for 470 completions. Okay. Um, with 22 interceptions. Graham in 07 through 713 times for 512 completions. That's 71.8% completion percentage. BJ was around 65, and it's 48 to 14 touchdowns to interceptions. So, I uh, I would say that's the greatest season, single season. BJ okay. certainly had more yard, more hey, yards, and more he, touchdowns. He's a gunslinger, man. You don't you don't have Absolutely. Brett Favre back there to to be Peyton Manning with the precision. Okay, you have him back there to sling the rock, and that's what he my did. my personal preference. And I think Graham Harrell had the best team around him. Um legitimately the best receiver in Michael Crabtree. So if I'm picking for this team, uh, I would go start BJ Mahomes on the bench uh, and I'm cutting Graham Harrell. I I would agree for this team because I think a huge part of Kitley's philosophy and identity is pushing the ball vertically. Yes. And Harrell was outstanding in the short game, intermediate game, the accuracy that you alluded to. Yeah. 
But if we're trying to push the ball down the field, give me Mahomes over anybody. Yes. So I'd probably start Mahomes. Well, and, and with uh with a with healthy legs, uh, you're even getting around the offensive line a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> But that one's tough, and uh, we're going to have more of those in the coming days, um, both Texas Tech-specific and Big 12, remembering some guys. Start, bench, cut, inside receiver, Welker, Amendola, Grant. <laughs> I don't have that one yet, um, but I do have – I have a Jakeem Grant, I think Tyler Lockett, and – Oh, nice. Maybe Jordan Shipley from Texas. Is um, that like re- receiver returner kind of thing? Um, yeah, it is more like a slot receiver. And I got an outside receiver with guys like Crabtree, Des Bryant. Oh, Bryant over Blackman? Uh, I, I think I have I have multiple lists for receivers because okay. there's so many. So Justin Justin Blackman is the greatest receiver in Big 12 history. False. Um, Crabtree was the first to do back-to-back bullet in the cost, but then Blackman did it right after. Terrence Williams, as far as single season, which is how I've identified oh, with, these. It, it's with like, Baylor? 2009 Jordan ship. It's not career. Terrence right. Williams had like, I think he had 120 something catches, 1800 yards one season with RG three when he won the Heisman. I think it was that season. Was that so, 2010? I think 11, but yeah, there's some, there's some good ones on there. All right. I'm excited for that. That's a, yeah. that's a really good concept. Yeah. Uh, and that, you know, it's fun to debate on Twitter. It's fun. Yeah, we'll to do see bad how, things. We'll see how long it takes another podcast to uh, do the same thing. I did see a subtweet today. I almost sent it to you. About us, I'll, sure. Yeah, well, about the situation. What's Anyways, the don't want to start some beef here. Um, Where's the beef? Let's talk depth chart, but before we do, I want to give a shout out to another one of our sponsors, Code Ninjas. They are running summer camps right now, all summer long here in Lubbock. Um, if you haven't already taken advantage, you can get $10 off registration for any summer camp using the promo code gauchos and that's good for any lubbock location code ninjas summer camp they teach kids ages 5 to 14 how to level up their coding stem and engineering skills in a fun hands-on environment these camps use technology that your kids already love like legos minecraft and roblox to expand their skills creativity and confidence again promo code gauchos you get ten dollars off I know our friend Spencer with the 23 Personnel podcast said his youngin is enjoying a Code Ninjas summer camp. Uh, Check them out, codeninjas.com, or give them a call, 806-370-0022. Gauchos, $10 off. I got to talk to uh, Code Ninjas, Mr. Code Ninjas himself at the Matadors game. Mr. Ninja is a cool guy. The Matadors game... Um, incredible atmosphere. Electric. Winning again, Trace uh, Uno. Should have been Trace Lucero, but yeah, you know. But I don't think they made the the playoffs. So yeah, I think we missed it by three points. But but the rest of the NPSL, Rob, was sweating because we we were four zero and one in the last five games. Like, yeah, if they had. If they had somehow led us into the playoffs or we had another game or two to get in there, it would have been over for the rest of the league. You didn't miss the playoffs. You ran out of time. True. Uh, but Mark, it was Adams, cool. Mark Adams' first kick. Uh, Jonathan Garibay missed two crossbars, and then they didn't let him do it again, so he just ran up and kicked a third without thinking. Nailed it. Yeah. It's awesome. Uh, I did get a chance to speak with the Mozos before the game. Uh, the Mozos are the drummers, trumpeters, chant leaders. shouters, chant leaders. Well, I don't want to call them yell leaders, which you kind of did a little bit. No, I said chant leaders. Chant leaders. Um, they do dress up in all white, the chant leader. It's you a talk, bit uh, yeah, Anyways, I talked, to, I talked to Jeff and Jordan before the game. Here's that interview. All right, we're here with the Mozos. If you've been to a Lubbock Matterers games with the guy on the bullhorn and the drum, Jeff and Jordan, how you guys doing? Doing good, man. Man, we're doing pretty good. So this is game six at home, five at home? Game six. six. Game, game final, six. final game. Final home game of the season. How's it been, the, the crowd response, the team response to you guys and what you do down there? 
man, unbelievable. It's been wild. You know, from the first game to now, it's just been such such a, a an awesome experience as far as reception from the community, reception from the club itself. It's just been it's been wild. It's been great. <laughs> yeah, we've been supported along the way. Uh, you know, something that's been funny about this season is in a lot of ways, we're bringing something that's never been in Lubbock to Lubbock, and that's soccer culture. And soccer culture with the big clubs all around the world, they have groups that support them, do drums. I mean, play and, and and give energy, feed energy to the players. So we're introducing that to Lubbock and some people have asked us like, are y'all gonna do that the whole game? But, uh, and we told them, yes, we replied with yes, this is gonna be 90 minutes. And that's and that's the point, we, we, uh, we bring the energy for 90 minutes. And that's no joke. It's literally 90 minutes of chaos down there. Uh, you never stop drumming, you never stop chanting. Uh, the chants you bring, uh, I recognize some of them, but some of them, I guess some customs. I do want to give you my favorite before you get into the chance you do. The Ain't No Pity in the Hub City. <laughs> Brilliant. Is that something you've seen before? Or is that just something that popped in your head? Yeah, you know, we uh, we take a lot of inspiration. I, I was a, in the supporters club at Kansas City and Ryan, our president, was in the supporters club at Portland. That's one of the chants that Portland does. They say, no, nope, ain't no pity in the Rose City, uh, which of course is Portland. Um, but a lot of our chants have been taken from, and, and that's and that's actually soccer culture is a lot of uh, chants right, are reused right, yeah. throughout uh, different clubs for different reasons. And you just change words and they're universal. Do you have to practice your stamina to scream for 90 minutes or is that something that comes natural? I know some of your past careers, you had to scream quite a bit, so. Yeah, uh, you know, it comes from a place down deep that I, I can't explain. <laughs> how that energy is there but uh, i tell you what as much as energy as i'm putting out i get more energy if there's fans around that are screaming chanting along as well yeah i mean last game was indicative of that like it seemed like everybody was shouting the same things we were shouting and almost where and i was telling jeff this at one point in the game i couldn't hear him i'm you know seven eight feet away from it on the bullhorn i couldn't hear him at all because of everybody else the, it seemed like the whole stadium was chanting and that was just that was magical i mean it was it was so cool to hear that the magic of soccer and i'm not a soccer guy i've never been a soccer guy i've grown in lubbock my whole life so i've it's never been readily available but that last game you're talking about the home game it's a tie you're down one late it ends in a tie or a draw whatever you say nil nil in soccer it's one of the most exciting atmospheres i've ever been in it ended in a tie so that's just the beauty of soccer it is it is it, you know when you can say that you enjoyed a tie in soccer which i think is very anti-american sports in a lot of ways um when you can say you enjoyed a tie in soccer it, you're a soccer fan because that game usually came with lots of energy lots of close chances Lots of just barely where the whole entire crowd goes, ooh, multiple times yeah. because just close chances were missed or red cards were thrown up and lots of drama. Absolutely. And to take your point further, Rob, I mean, I'm the same way. Didn't really grow up with soccer. Still don't know a whole lot about it. But, it, you know, growing up with this idea that a tie is boring, a tie is worthless, you know, whatever. But having been through that, set through that, set through the passion, the emotion of what a tie is in soccer it's it's remarkable it's it's awesome to see how you know a tie actually can like give you some juice that's, that's cool and what's crazy you use the word passion i don't think you're overstating it at all as we said this is game six there's been five games in lubbock and i think four of them were over four thousand uh -huh. one of them on a wednesday night when there's two games in a week was 2500 it was yeah. almost yeah three thousand or four thousand something like that. so yeah. it, it, the response has been amazing um the first game y'all sat behind the, the the Matador's bench. And I noticed later on you're behind the opposing bench. Did they ask you to move because you're so loud or was that a um, was that a strategic moment from you guys to get in the other team's head? Because I will say the team has been playing better at home since you moved. I don't want to give you too much credit here, but it is it is true. You've not lost at home yeah. since you moved. Yeah. Well, you know, that was actually an idea uh, from the GM who we communicate with quite frequently. He just asked us, or he kind of made a joke about how our, our coach was having a hard time yelling to his players on the field. And so he thought, well, why wouldn't we move them behind the opposing bench in the, in the stadium that we're in now? It's the perfect spot for us to uh, 
um, maybe affect the game a little bit. I don't know. We'll see. Certainly, I think. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know exactly what came from it, um, but you know, the fact that Dustin, the GM, he he talks with us all the time, and, and he puts in his you know his two cents and whatnot. So I think it really was a. I, I never really thought about it until now. Like you know. Um, lossless, if you will, at home since the move, but um, it's, that's kind of kind of a cool stat, I guess. I think they're calling it an unbeaten streak. Unbeaten yeah, streak. yeah, that's, that's what you call it. So you have yeah. the draws, and so the... draws still give you points in soccer. That's yeah. it's it's strategic in that way. Sometimes, I mean, just a little more knowledge on soccer. If you're if you're going away and you get a point, that's a good result in a lot of ways because home is where players like to play and they play the best typically. And I've noticed just through social media, the rest of the MPSL teams, especially in the Lone Star Conference, which the Matadors play in, I don't want to have, say, zero home field advantage, but it certainly feels like the Matadors with the Mozos have, by far and away, um, a, a better home field advantage. Is that something you've heard from the players? Is that something that's going around the locker room? And I did hear a, an interesting story from Dustin that said one of the players – the last home game, I don't remember who that was, the Fort Worth maybe, or whoever it was. Irving, Irving. Yeah, 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 yeah. One of the players from the opposing team told Dustin to, hey, take a look at me next year because yeah. yeah. this crowd is awesome. And I think that's happening probably more frequently than that one time. Um, but, yeah, just like through the grapevine, we've heard that, you know, it's just it's an insane atmosphere for what the, the Matadors program is, you know, like – going across Texas having two, three hundred people there in what seems like a like a high school field, you know, no drums, no yelling, you know, it's like the golf clapping type of thing. Um, to come into this, which is just like trying to stimulate as much as like that organic soccer culture feel that we have heard that, you know, through the grapevine yeah. here, that it is very, very different. Um at, at, at loudery field as we're loudery. To call it. <laughs> I like to make it loudery. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so do you have, a, like, a favorite moment of the season, maybe from the Mozo's perspective or just from the Matterport's perspective? Uh, for me, man, it was that first home game win. It, it had been – it was already halfway through the season. And at the end of the game, when we trounced the other team, uh, it was I think it was 5 mil that game, um, all the players came over and we were just beating drums and singing as loud as we can. And they came and celebrated with us. And the energy, and, and that's the kind of energy you can't duplicate. And those types of moments where supporters and players get to celebrate the win almost at the same level. It's, it's just a magical, really amazing experience. Yeah, and I, I kind of mentioned it earlier, but for me it was in that last game specifically when we were, it was like a red card chant. I don't even know what the chant was. But that was the that's moment where, yeah, 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 yeah. That yeah, was yeah. the moment where I'm like pounding the drums, and I just kind of look back, and it seemed like I couldn't hear much of anything, but it seemed like everybody's voices were saying the same thing, and it almost became like the whole stadium at that moment became the supporter section, um, and that's when I couldn't hear Jeff on the on the megaphone, and I didn't really know what was happening. But it was that was a really cool organic moment where it just seemed like everybody was like. They had one goal, and that was to convince the ref that that dude needed a red card, and that was pretty sweet. And then he pulled it out. Yeah, yeah that then was he pulled awesome. it out. Yeah, yeah. So and then it The whole place went nuts. And then you sang a na 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 goodbye. Yeah, so yeah. that so might have been the longest red card delay. And I've watched <laughs> so a lot of soccer. Was so that was very strange. But yeah. hey, that's what we're here for. We're here to affect the game. We're here to give players energy, and we're here to influence the game in that way. And. I can't think of nothing. I can't think of anything worse than a silent soccer game. Yeah, in my opinion. Oh yeah, that'd be miserable. For sure. All right, so this is the final game of the year. Not only home game, but game period. Unless they make the playoffs, this interview will air after the game. So I think where they're at the table for the standings for the non-soccer folk. Yeah. Uh, where you are on the table, if they win tonight, they'll be in a position to make the playoffs. If some other dominoes fall, right? It, it, I think that's how it, it is. Yeah, it's it's gonna have to be some dominoes falling in the right places. Okay, I mean, it's a long shot, but hey, yeah, there's always a chance. It's love right? right? Yeah, but there's a control. Like they have to win. They have yeah. to get those three points, and then and that's what we're focused on right now, just getting those three points. And then, you know, those dominoes fall awesome, but we got to do our job, and so that's what we're trying to impact. All right, so let's say the ga- the games are over for the year. Uh, they're coming back next year, but we're assuming. 
uh, it's been an incredible turnout. I would assume something will be here next summer with the Matadors. Uh, what, what's going on in between? Are we doing uh, World Cup watch parties? Do we have anything planned for the Mozos? Nothing really planned at the moment. I mean, we don't actually plan much, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like us. Yeah. Yeah. So, but it, it probably will be. I mean, World Cup is coming up, so I'm sure that we're going to get on that, have some watch parties at Two Dogs. Two Dogs has been awesome with, with supporting us specifically and supporting um, the, Mo and the Matadors, but I'm sure we'll do something like that. Um, once the spring gets here, once, you know, word about the Matador starts kicking up again, April, you know, May, all that kind of stuff. I'm sure we'll have some events, get to know you, painting parties, trying to paint some big banners, you know, rehearsals, whatnot. But just kind of, it'll happen. We, we just don't know when. <laughs> or Jeff, I know you're a soccer guy. Any World Cup picks for us? We are a gambling podcast. <laughs> uh... France is going to be a powerhouse, of course. Uh, if I if I had to pick someone to win it all this year, France could repeat. I mean, they're they've they've got a ton of talent. Uh, I, I would love to see Argentina go a little far again. This is probably Messi's last World Cup. This is probably Ronaldo. Some of the greats that we that we've been watching for years. This is probably their last World Cup. Uh, they probably won't make it, but I am pumped about this USA team. They're young, they're uh, hungry, and they've got some of the best talent we've ever seen on a USA team ever. I think they'll go much further than, than expectation, especially from you know the normal average USA soccer fan. I think they're gonna go further than what we what we anticipate. I will say if, if USA gets out of the first pool or whatever they call it, the two docks will be packed. That's just oh, yeah. kind of what absolutely. happens. Yeah. It, I remember the, the last World, World Cup will that, be packed, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, we'll nice. gather to watch this game. And that's, I mean, that's so special. Like, yeah. that's just an amazing yeah. tournament. And the whole world watches for a month. And uh, there's nothing better. Yeah. What was that, 2010, the last time USA made a deep run, maybe? 14. 14? 14. We got They're also in 10? Belgium. Uh, we, yeah, we I got to say the was, same stage. Okay, uh, We got to the knockout stage, both of those World Cups. I was on like a road trip in 2010, I think, and like was listening on the radio. Yeah. yeah. No reason to, I mean, yeah. it, was, it, was a huge, it was awesome. Yeah, it was a fantastic game. I remember, I think we all took off work to watch when we played England. We were yeah, lunch man. one time. It was like a whole bunch of us yeah. just like watching the, you know, yeah. what was that Revolutionary War Part 2 or something. Yeah, uh, we got, football. and we got them again. Yeah. So, <laughs> they're, in our, they're in our draw, so uh, it'll be beat the Redcoats that day. Yeah. All right, final final question, I guess. Uh, where do the people follow you or follow along the journey, the Mozos, social media, whatever? Yes, yeah, so we've got Instagram and Twitter, um, Mozos and LBK, and Facebook, yeah, yeah sure. So uh, Mozos LBK. Um, we're always promoted through the Matadors as well, so yeah, most a lot of their stories tags us too. So. Um, that's where a lot of our stuff is going to be posted throughout the year, like if we're getting together doing things. Uh, so, yeah, Moses LBK uh, on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Just check us out. Follow us. Come out to a game. Yeah, come out to a game. Hang stand, out. That's the, that's the big thing. Yeah. Once Chance next year gets here, games happen. Uh, our section is not exclusive to any, like, fan membership. Like, if you want to come down and hang out, that's what you Yeah. Yep. Hang out. Come hang out. Come hang out. Come, hang out. come, come yeah. out. Stream. If you've got drums, bring them. If you've got trumpets, bring them. Tubas, whatever, bring those. If you can get in the gate with them. Like, wear a freaking awesome costume yeah. or like a weird costume. Let's, yeah. I mean, let's make it weird. If I get five people next year wearing banana suits, like, I'm buying them beers after the game. <laughs> That's the goal. Yeah. Beers at Buffalo Wild Wings. Yeah. All right. Thanks, guys. I know y'all are about to march into the stadium. It's another cool tradition. Um, Let's go Matadors. Absolutely, go, baby. Again, we hope the Lubbock Matadors come back next season. I don't know if they'll come back uh, MPSL. I don't know if they'll come back something else. Uh, that has been rumored. Dude, if but they it, let us into the MLS, it is over. <laughs> 40,000 strong. That's why they won't let us They're in. They're playing man. at the Jones. They're sweating. Yeah, they are. Uh, but it just I, – I just can't – I can't say it enough how fun those games were. Um, I think I went to all but one, all but two, maybe. I guess I went four times this year. Yeah, I incredible, think I did six as well. Incredible atmosphere. A legitimate 4,000 at five out of six games. And the only one that wasn't was the Wednesday night where you had two games in one week. Yeah. And they held that momentum through, what, two and a half weeks 
not in Lubbock. Yeah, we had a I think a three, three game weeks? road trip. Um, yeah, so and and I've said this before, but yeah, that was pretty much my only fear was that game one everybody's going to go say, hey, what's this Lubbock Matadors thing about, and then not show up for game two. It was not like that. I mean, if anything, no. it even continued to build because people heard about how fun it was. And, I mean, I don't think yeah. you could have drawn up a better first season, especially when you compare us to other teams around the league and their atmospheres. I mean, it, yeah. it just doesn't compare. Well, when you say it like that, it, it really is the perfect season because you get to go from your first season into the World Cup and have some kind of residual soccer love in Lubbock uh, with watch parties at two docks and and everything else that the Mozos and the Matadors are going to be doing. Um, because I would assume if they're going to stay a team, they're going to stay active in the community year round, uh, which is like maybe a skeleton crew and not the whole yeah. shebang. But it, it was cool. Um, it's, it's been really fun to see how the team has embraced the Mozos, who I don't think started out as like an official group of any sort, but they sort of became that. And right. You know, they the team comes and celebrates right in front of the Mozos uh, after every game. And, you know, even I saw an opposing player after the the loss that the Diablos were handed last night kind of just like wave and sort of like nod his head yeah. to the Mozos like, hey, this is cool. Like we don't get this at every stadium. Um, so yeah, it was fun. I, got, I uh, don't know if I was supposed to do this, but I hopped onto the field after the game and talked to our boy Luke Jones and – He's just as polite in person as, as you remember sure, from our yeah. interview. He like shook my hand three times and I was like, you know, do you know if you're coming back next summer? He was like, you know, if I have the opportunity, I definitely will. Did so, he call you a top lad again? He didn't call me a top lad, but I know oh, he was man. I know he was thinking it. <laughs> uh almost some more fights too. I know. I was almost surprised there wasn't one. Like there was legit shoving. <laughs> and I was like, okay, somebody's about to swing, but nobody did. If somebody had swung, um, we know who they could have called. Yeah, if you had allegedly been baited into yeah. a fight on the soccer pitch um, and dealt somebody a catastrophic injury, you could call our friends at Barnett, Howard, and Williams, law firm started by three Texas Tech grads, office in Fort Worth, kind of a little bit closer to the Denton Diablos home turf. But as you know, Rob, they handle cases all across the state of Texas. They're one of the only law firms in the Lone Star State that is certified for Title IX student representation. They've defended students, including scholarship athletes, in Title IX litigation at all of the major universities in Texas. They also handle catastrophic injury cases. And for listeners in the DFW area, they do handle criminal defense and family law matters. They hope you never need them. They don't want to see a fight between the Diablos and the Matadors out on the pitch. Absolutely not. But they are here for you if that were to allegedly occur. You can find out more about Barnett, Howard, and Williams by visiting their website, bhwlawfirm.com. All right, Don Williams of the Lubbock Avalanche Journal has put together a post-spring depth chart. Uh, this dropped on July 3rd, but I thought there was a lot of interesting information in here, and obviously we're a bit busy in our last couple of podcasts. So I want to get to it today. Um, do you want to start on the offensive side? Yeah. And I'll just give you the starting five offensive linemen, and then we can kind of talk around the, the backups. Okay. Uh, left tackle, Caleb Rogers. Left guard, Cole Spencer. That is the Western Kentucky transfer. Uh, center, Dennis Wilborn. Backup, Cade Briggs. Cade Briggs is the New Mexico transfer. Uh, right guard, Weston Wright. Right tackle, Monroe Mills. Monroe Mills from Oklahoma State. Weston Wright, obviously a returner. Caleb Rogers, a returner. Uh, the other three transfers, uh, including Dennis Wilburn, a transfer as well. All right, I've got three thoughts on that. Okay. First, Caleb Rogers at left tackle, Weston Wright at right guard. By the way, saying Weston Wright at right guard is yeah, Weston tough. White. Weston White at white guard. Yeah. Um, th those are your returning starters, as you alluded to. Did not have a ton of experience coming back on the offensive line. So no surprise at all to see those two kind of be the anchors, one on the interior, one on the outside. Um, also kind of demonstrates how badly you needed an, an infusion of bodies and talent. Um, the extent to which you see brand new faces in the two deep, I think shows that. Yeah. Um, so at center, I think 
I think Cade Briggs will be the starter, but I think he was out during the spring yes, either due to injury or he didn't transfer in time. I think he'll probably earn the starting center position I before think he the had end of the season. Surgery. Really? Something. I think he was injured. I am I gotta say a he little bit surprised. Up his shoulder or something. A little bit surprised at Monroe Mills. So let, let me start by saying this. Moving left to right, not surprised at left tackle, not surprised at left guard. Cole Spencer, that's why you bring him in. Yeah. Uh, don't think I'll be surprised at center if Cade Briggs does ultimately become the starter there. Not surprised at right guard. A little bit surprised at right tackle only because Monroe Mills was a redshirt freshman last season at Oklahoma State. I don't think had much experience on the field, maybe doing some special teams. Uh, kind of thought maybe a different transfer – with playing time at the FCS level or at the group of five level might have factored into that position. Um, thought maybe a guy like Landon Peterson might be ready to move up. I don't know if he's more of a, an interior guy. but So Landon Peterson and Michael Shanahan, the guys you just mentioned, uh, the FCS starter, obviously Michael Shanahan, uh, at second and third at right guard on the depth chart. Uh, but right tackle, Monroe Mills, Ty Buchanan, the USC transfer. And Ethan Card, who's been at Texas Tech for several seasons. Yeah, so I, I'm a little bit surprised that a guy like Card or Buchanan maybe didn't, um, or Landon Peterson didn't crack the starting rotation. But I think a lot of times on the O line, you after the starting five, you have like a your number six and seven and eight can play multiple positions. Yeah. So like on Peterson, he might be listed as a backup right guard, but he might also be the backup right tackle and yeah. left guard or something like that. I would so. not be surprised as a redshirt freshman that Ty Buchanan is the starter by week eight. From, from yeah. what I've heard about, let's call it his personality, I think he fits the future yeah. uh, mode of what uh, Hamby wants to do. Yeah, and I – I think that this is the position group, offense or defense, that people are probably most concerned about. Again, there's a reason why they brought in five yeah. transfers or whatever it was. Seven. But seven? Jeez. Yeah, I think so. Um, but Hamby, I think, has a really good track record so far in his career. Yeah. Um, four of his guys out of five, obviously, at Western Kentucky last season were first or second team, all conference USA. And they played for a good offense, but look, if you're going to drop back and throw it 60 times a game like they did with Zappy, you need guys that can at least pass protect. I don't know how good they were at run blocking, but so he yeah. brought two of them over, and I think clearly he knows how to coach some guys up. Um, so anyway, she brought one over. I thought there was another one besides Cole Spencer. From there was there. another one. Uh, maybe. I think there was another one rumored, but I don't think he ever. Oh, you might be right. I might be uh, – yeah, because Cade Briggs is from New Mexico. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. That, he might be the one I'm thinking of then. Okay. But, yeah, I, I'll say all that to say I think he can coach up what he's got, and hopefully that that's a, a serviceable unit. Okay, so on the depth chart, there are two outside receiver positions, two inside receiver positions, and tight end. Mm -hmm. So five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. There's 12 positions on the depth chart. Um, and I don't know if that's just to get more guys named on here <laughs> or if you're legit going to have four wide receiver positions that are going to be in and out and you kind of do four different things. I think that's part of it because yeah, under, under the last regime, you played with a tight end a lot. With Yost, you played with one exclusively. But I think you could have packages where two slot receivers are in the game and sometimes one tight end is in the game. Maybe two tight ends are in the game. I don't know. Uh, they have referenced 13 personnel. Okay. Just one running on. back and three tight ends. Let's go. All right, so the outside wide receivers, Duran Bradley, J.J. Sparkman, Chidarius Townsend at the first outside position. Loic Funchy, Trey Q, Cleveland, Brady Boyd, one, two, three, at the second outside receiver position. That is six, five, six, four, six foot, six, four, six, four, six, one. Yeah, so you're not terribly experienced at those starting spots. You said Jaron Bradley and Loic Funchy are the starters? Yes. Um, where's J.J. Sparkman on that? He is uh, second behind Duran Bradley. Okay. Sorry. I'm and then that. Trey Cleveland is second behind Loke Fungi. I, I am a huge Trey Cleveland fan, and I think J.J. Sparkman has the best body control on the team. 
was going to say, I would guess that those four, high pointing. Um, first off, none of them have a ton of experience. Um, Fungi right. is in year three now with the program. So he's at least hopefully got yes. some maturity and all that. But I anticipate, yeah, you'll have a starter, but I think all four of them will rotate a lot until there's some separation. Um, Jaron Bradley certainly flashed in the bowl game, as did J.J. Sparkman. I think Fungi was injured. Yeah. He flashed in the 2020 game in Stillwater, had a really great catch. So I I think if I were a betting man or, or a gambling gaucho, as it were, I would say that of those four, two of them probably emerge and become really good receivers. Yeah. Um, so I, I feel good about offense. that. I, yeah, I feel good about that position group despite the lack of experience. I think somebody will rise to the top. And even though Sherry Towns is moving positions, that is – you had three transfers starting on the offensive line. You have one transfer in that wide receiver position group, and it's the third receiver in, this, in the, the bottom group. So you yeah. have some you have some guys that have been here and been on campus, and, and that's well, good to see. And you and I, I think, both thought that Brady Boyd played well in the spring game. Yes, one hundred percent. Think hopefully he's picking up the offense. Yeah, well, absolutely. and you know, if he if he were relied on for playing time, I think he'd do all right. All right, the starting inside receivers are Xavier White and Miles Price. Um, I would assume Miles Price is the starter, and then Xavier White's in this kind of second slot. Yeah. Maybe outside, inside receiver. Uh, Nehemiah Martinez behind Xavier White. And then Drew Hocutt, transfer from San Angelo. You might recognize the name. It is that Hocutt, uh, second behind Miles Price. And if you listen to, like, coach interviews during the spring, they, like, were begging to get Drew Hocutt's name into any answer. And so <laughs> apparently he had a huge spring, really hard worker, um, is reliable. A, is he a lunch pail kind of guy? Jim lunch pail, Blue sneaky collar. athletic, yeah. gritty. Yeah. Uh, and then you have uh, Tyler King, which – He's going to play this year. Okay. We have, we have heard true freshman uh, from Elif Taylor, Tyler King in the mix. Is Jordan Brown on there? He's not. I'm surprised at that. He's a transfer from Kansas. I think right. he was a walk on there, walk on here. Uh, I guess followed Emmett Jones. Um, had heard he was playing really well in the spring and that he was going to factor in. And he, he still could, but I just yeah, and again, yeah. thought he'd be in the two deep, but maybe just not in this version. I'll say this too, Rob. Uh huh. This far out from the season, sometimes the yeah. two deep is to get guys yeah. motivated. Yes. 100%. And uh, not necessarily – or in fact, very far from like, this is locked in for who's going to trot out there during the first game. This is all in pencil for sure. Cause you still have all fall camp. I'm going to say something that I don't want to be taken negatively, but I think certainly we'll follow Joey McGuire around. I think he runs his program a little bit like a high school program. And again, I don't want that to sound negative because it's not like he's lower level. But I think there is a lot of that, like, hey, we're going to wear all the same shirt and we're going to do this. And the stuff you do in high school to build camaraderie. Um, and, and we've seen that with the last couple. There was like one year, was it Cliff's last year where they were all wearing brown shirts and then they like graduated to the green shirt or something and. If you didn't pass, you stayed in the brown shirt. Was that Matt Wells' first year, maybe? Uh, was, was that a, a Rusty Witt thing? That's what I was thinking. So maybe it was uh, 2018. Anyways, I just feel like there's like like the bulletin board material stuff and that kind of stuff. It's kind of not hokey. That's the wrong word. But do you know what I'm saying? Like he, yeah, so are his, you... his only high school – his only head coaching experience is from the high school ranks, so – Unless you count being an associate head coach. Right, yeah, at Baylor. Assistant to the associate head coach. Um, so are you saying you don't necessarily – you're not a fan of that approach, or is that just no, an I observation? Like it. oh, okay. It's an, ob- it's an observation, but I like it. I do too because I I mean, think, I'm a cheesy guy. I think, you know, something that makes Joey's perspective unique compared to other coaches is he knows better than just about anybody – 
what will help a high school student athlete transition successfully to being a collegiate student athlete. Yes. Because as many guys that got recruited out of Cedar Hill while he was there, he probably saw some of them excel, some of them fall flat on their face once they got to college, some of them not make it. So I bet he kind of understands what, especially the 18, 19 year olds at their first, you know, the first time being out of the house or whatever, what they kind of need in a team setting from their coaches and leaders and teammates versus guys that maybe have some experience at the NFL level or something like that and try to run the program like it's a professional organization. Um, this was something that was pointed out to us. Was this on Twitter or in Discord? Which one? I think uh, one of our Twitter followers, AJ, DM'd us about this very topic and said that he oh, thought he? that, yeah, that Texas Tech was kind of running things similar to a high school program in a good way. Yeah, in a good way. I didn't see that. So, AJ, great minds. Uh, running back easy, Sir Roderick Thompson or Taj Brooks. I think Taj Brooks probably the starter there, but Sir Roderick older, wiser. And then Cameron Valdez, third one listed. And then quarterbacks. Another interesting note. You ready? Yep. Shuck or Smith or Baron Morton. Three-way race, huh? Three-way race. West Texas own Baron Morton. That's interesting. It's one of those like, one, is it really a competition? Yeah. And two, if it's not, why are you leaving it? that ambiguous yeah and, and don also wrote this week that joey has set a date to complete his quarterback battle uh i hope he has i, I hope that's early in fall camp and it's not the cliff kingsbury will know it when they run out there yeah stuff um, I, I i think there's something to i think the team needs to know who the quarterback is yeah. like a week or yes. two before the game like the, yes. the, they need to go to practice for a full week before the game and know Tyler is a quarterback or Donovan is a quarterback. Or Barron is the quarterback. Yeah. All right, moving to the defense. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven positions on this one, not twelve. So we don't get an extra safety or something. Don't get the nickel back. You like nickel back? Yeah. Uh now it's really a, a three three five. But also a four four a four two five. Um I think Tyree Wilson and Josiah Pierre, whoever those outside guys are, are gonna be back off up around. Um but on the depth chart it has uh field side defensive end and boundary defensive end. So uh Tyree Wilson, Jalen Hutchings, Tony Bradford at the nose tackle. And then Josiah Pierre. So that's your front four. Uh, Tyree Wilson, LB Moore, Miles Cole from Louisiana Monroe. And true freshman, Joseph Adedire. Can you say the backup defensive lineman again? Uh, This is the backup to Tyree Wilson. Is LB Moore, Miles Cole, Joseph Adedire. Okay. The backups behind Jalen Hutchings, Philip Bleedy, who I think will play a lot. Uh, Vital Scott who is one of the new transfers and, and miles Cole again on the depth chart. Uh, and then behind Tony Bradford, Philip Bleedy, and vital Scott. Uh, so I would assume the two defensive tackles positions will be Hutchings, Bradford, Bleedy, Scott, miles Cole, uh, like this. Boom, boom, I, boom, 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 yeah. Boom. Again, I think you'll have starters in name, like the guys that are out there for the first play of the game, but I think Bleedy will yeah. play just as much as, or if not just as much as, you know, 85% of the same amount of snaps yeah. as Bradford and Hutchings. Or, you know, they'll just go – they'll have a third and long package or a run stuff package, and you know, yeah. maybe all three will be out there, you know, something like that. Uh, and this is interesting, too. Behind Josiah Pierre, which is basically a linebacker out there, uh, Bryce Ramirez, who's been here a long time but really not gotten on the field as much, uh, and then Dimitri Moore, a senior transfer from Vanderbilt, among other places – a former Cedar Hill guy. Uh, but he's also the starter at the Will linebacker. Uh, him and Kosai Eldridge listed there. Middle linebacker listed as Creshawn Mayweather and Jacob Rodriguez. I would not be surprised if Jacob Rodriguez 
plays more than Creshawn Merriweather this year. I think Creshawn Merriweather is a very good first, second down linebacker. He he is not active in coverage um, or uh, blitzing the quarterback. He's a very good run defender. I'm, I'm excited for Jacob Rodriguez. Um, you and I have heard good things about him from the spring. He's a walk-on. I don't think that'll last for very long. No. Uh, here's a prediction if they – and I have no insight until here, but if it's one of those things where at the end of fall camp they've got two scholarships left over and they give him out, yep. I think he's probably up there. 100%. Uh, and he, he was recruited as a quarterback. He played quarterback at Wichita Falls Ryder. Uh-huh. I think signed with Virginia as a quarterback, and then I think yep. they tried to move him to tight end. And now he's playing linebacker. And so imagine the body type you need to play quarterback, tight end, and linebacker. I think he's probably just one of those freak athletes. And, yeah, as soon as he gets some experience under his belt, I think he's going to take off. I've got Uh, another prediction. Okay. They're doing the the number three this year for the Fight Like Luke number. Yeah. It's going to go to the hardest worker, basically. Yeah, I would not be surprised to see Jacob Rodriguez the number three next year. Uh, that'd be cool. Um, another note on the defensive front, uh, Tyree Wilson, I am proclaiming, is my favorite player on the team this season. If Texas Tech has uh, – they got blanked in the preseason All-Big 12 team. If they have one person on the postseason All-Big 12 team – if one person makes it from Texas Tech, it's Tyree Wilson. I'm going to push back on that particular prop bet because I think Miles Price could have a monster year in Zach Kittley's offense. Is that fair? Yes, but yes, that's fair. Okay, here's I'm going to come up with another prop bet on the fly for you. Okay. Do you want to hear the rest of the secondary real quick? Um, no, because I want to stay on the defensive front because okay. it's related to that. Well, we got sacks, total yes. sacks. So, no, not total sacks. Tyree oh. Wilson had seven sacks last year. Over. Hang on. <laughs> the uh, single season record. Over. <laughs> Hang on. Single what, season 13 record. 13 and a half? It's 15. Brandon Sharp in 2009. Oh, wow. I would um, not have guessed that. There's some guys behind him with 14, 13, 12. How many did Pete Robertson have? Pete Robertson had 12 in 2014. He led the Big Brandon, 12 that season. Brandon Jackson? Brandon Jackson. Uh, he's not in the top 10. That's funny because back-to-back years, those guys led the Big 12 in sex. And then, like, I, you haven't had a dominant pass rusher since. I didn't remember that Brandon Jackson. Uh, so, to get on the top 10 list, single season, Tyree Wilson would need nine to, like, yes. tie Aaron Hunt, McKinner, Dixon with nine sacks. Yeah, if you gave me nine and um, a half, I would take the over. Okay, so moving up, uh, if he was going to tie for seventh, he would need ten and a half. That's Monte Rager and Calvin Riggs. Monte Rager was an All-American. All right, over. Over ten and a half? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to keep working my way up the ladder. Uh, Sean Jackson has 11, and then Aaron Hunt Pete Robertson have 12 each. They're tied for fourth. I would go over 11 and a half, but I would – I would be hard pressed to do over 12 and a half, but I, okay, so I'll I set think it he can get to 12. So I'll set it at 11 and a half. And if the over catches, he'll be tied for fourth, at yeah. least tied for fourth in school history for single season sacks. I mean, you just look back at like the second half of year one against Texas. Freaking animal. Uh, Oklahoma last year, I thought he had a really good game. I thought the bowl defensive game. line played really good. He had yeah, three then, sacks in the bowl game, right? Yeah, in the in the bowl game, uh, you know, Mike Leach saying, "Who can block him? Not F and one." That was a goat tweet. Uh, if, yeah. if you know, you know. Thank you. Uh, so, Tyree Wilson, I'm I'm very high on Tyree Wilson. You're going over eleven and a half. Yeah, baby. I mean, double digits okay. for sure. Okay. I am hammering nine and a half. I would sprinkle eleven and a half. Okay. Yeah. All right, and if I gave you, if I gave you even odds on, uh, if only one makes the Big Twelve All Conference team at the end of the season, yeah, if both or neither make it, you push. But if only one makes it, will it be Miles Price or Tyree Wilson at even odds? Who would you pick? I would pick Tyree Wilson. Okay. I mean, I like Big Twelve Defensive Lineman of the Year, Tyree Wilson. Okay. Yeah. All right. I I respect it. 
Okay, let's go to the secondary. Wait, but before we do, is uh, is a linebacker? Um, he should be in his third year. I think he's from Shirts. Uh, Derek Lewis is he anywhere? No. Uh. Uh-uh. Interesting. Okay. No. And and again, Demetri Moore is on there twice. Um, at boundary defensive end and and uh, Will. Okay. So I'm assuming if you go nickel or whatever, he'll be rotated down to the defensive line and you'll just have probably Jacob Rodriguez out there. Okay. Because I don't think you'll I don't think you'll put Creshawn on an island like they did last right. year. No, he needs to just be a run stuffer. I mean, those linebacker combos they had last year were baffling sometimes. It, great against the run. Great against well, a lot of those Rico um um, Schooler and Creshawn were all great run linebackers. They just look. Yeah, if you're a, if you're a linebacker in the Power Five who runs a, a four nine, you're probably a really damn good run stuffer. Yeah. And that's what they were. <laughs> yes, all three of them. All right, uh, Adrian Fry and Rayshad Williams starting corners. Malik Dunlap backing both of them up. Uh, Kobe Miner also in the rotation at corner. Uh, and then you basically have three safeties, which is why it looks like a four-two-five. You're going to have two strong safeties and a free safety. Uh, so you'll have the star, which is Marquise Waters, uh, which, if you look at Iowa State, is going to be that extra linebacker safety type yeah. position. He, he's got the body type for that, for sure. Which I thought would be Reggie Pearson, but it's going to be Marquise Waters. Uh, Rabbit at free safety, Reggie Pearson. Uh, at the other strong safety position. Then I'm just going to read the names because it's just two names that are backing up all three safety positions. Okay. Uh, Keon Blankenbaker. Okay. Who's a transfer senior. And Tyler Owens, the transfer from Texas. Okay. Yeah. Uh, listed as the second free safety. And then Blankenbaker and Tyler Owens. Uh, uh, in both of those uh, strong safety positions. So I, I love this position group, um, especially your starters, your top line talent. If those five can stay healthy, I think this kind of rivals Taj Brooks and Sir Roderick Thompson for the best position group on the team, offense or defense. Yeah. Um, I think Rashad Williams at the end of last season was a fantastic corner um, in coverage. He's got the length for it. Um, Adrian Fry feels like he's been here forever. He was a freshman All American, and um, he's had some good seasons. Uh, the he Rabbit several positions. Yeah, I think they moved him to safety, and now he's back to corner. Uh, Rabbit at the end of the season, ton of pass breakups. Muddy Waters, we saw him flash before he got hurt, and we know Reggie Pearson can lay the wood. So I love that position group, and I'm glad that this seemingly is a scheme that that fits that skill set really well. Cause I think muddy waters is the perfect linebacker safety hybrid. I think rabbit roaming as a free safety is a great fit. And then you've got um, three corners that I think can play the two corner slots. So I expect to see some rotation there to keep their legs fresh. I hope that this is kind of the cornerstone of the defense. And I, um, I mentioned this when we were on with big game boomer, but if you can generate a good pass rush with Tyree Wilson and around Tyree Wilson, and then you've got some ball Hawks, and coverage guys like you have in the secondary, I think you could have your strong suit on defense be against the pass, and hopefully you can keep everything in front of you, be serviceable against the run. I do worry about depth on the defensive line. If you have a couple injuries, especially on the interior there, uh, I worry. But I, I feel good about your pass rush. I feel good about your DBs, and so I hope they lean into that, and, and that becomes part of their identity on the defensive side of the ball. Trey Wolf listed as the first kicker. Yeah, he was nails as a freshman. Yes, he was. And then, obviously, Austin McNamara, the punter. Adrian Fry. Kick and returner, punt returner. Yeah, he was punt returner toward the end of last season. Going back to all Big 12, how was the Big 12, the returning Big 12 record holder for punt average not on the yeah preseason I, all Big 12 list? N- not know. that that list matters for anything. Right. But... Okay, so going back well, to my why. prop. I know why. Yeah, but it's not a good I, just. Michael Turk is famous on TikTok. Cool, good for him. Austin McNamara is good in real life. So, 
I think uh, I would put him as more likely to be all Big 12 than either Tyree Wilson or Miles Price. I wouldn't. Really? He has an argument that he's already the best punter in Big 12 history, and he probably Absolutely. only got better over he's the offseason. The, at 100%, he's the second best punter in Big 12 history uh, behind Michael Dickinson. Put oh, yeah. Absolute boot. He almost beat us single handedly in 2017. Yes. yes. Just absolutely flipping the effing field. Anyways, uh, the punter kicker selections for all Big 12 are always like, wait, who is good? Okay, their punter could be the best. Like, that's just. You might be right. Like, it just does not feel off merit generally. I also think. 100% awesome McNamara is a freaking All American. But. I was going to say, I, I, think, I, yeah. I also think as far as guys that have good odds to play on Sunday after this season, One, uh, 100%. He and Tyree Wilson are going to be uh, drafted or on an NFL roster uh, yes. this time next year. For show. Sure. Um, how about tight think? ends? Uh, oh, I totally skipped the tight ends. Yeah, because you bad. got Baylor Cup. You got Mason Tharp coming back. Do you want to guess the tight ends? Does it say Mason Tharp or Baylor Cup? Nope. Or Henry Teeter? Nope. There's no ors. Is Mason Tharp the starter? Yes. Okay. And then Baylor Cup? No. Henry Teeter. Really? Baylor Cup has not uh, done anything yet for the coaches. So okay. I, I would assume he'll be playing, but uh, Mason Tharp the starter. And Red Zone, look at this. Red Zone. 13 personnel, 6'9", 250, 6'7", 253, 6'4", 240. If Henry Teeter's in at fullback and you have those other two on the line of scrimmage or you know up there as like a wing and an a inline tight end, mm-hmm. and or even if they're both at the end yeah. of the – they actually would have to be at, at the end of the line on both sides to have a – you know what I mean. But All right, here's the situation, Rob. Yeah. I'm not a big two quarterback guy, but if Shuck or Donovan is the starter, imagine this goal line package. You got Donovan Smith under center. Yeah. Uh, Taj Brooks with his tree trunk thighs at running back. Yeah. Henry Teeter at fullback. Yeah. Double tight end Tharp and Cup on either side of the uh, uh-huh. offensive line. And then throw one of your six five receivers out there out wide. What are they going to do? Yeah. You can run it down their throat. You can go play action. You can go direct snap to the quarterback. I mean, take your pick. You can pick on some 5'11 corner out there. What are you going to do? Or, I mean, even if you're all tight and Miles Price is at wing and you're doing some action where he's – Bring, bring you know, everybody in tight the and then bring him right across. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Something. Motion, whatever you do. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. I love that. I, ooh, I hope we see it. There's I want a, first and goal at the three. See what they come a, up with. There's a formation – on Madden <laughs> where it's tight end and then the other two tight ends off the line of scrimmage but tight yeah and then one receiver to the left money that's a money formation so yeah I'm, I'm down with that uh, especially if it's pistol and you have Taj behind Donovan oh yeah so you yeah, could also do I'm like some, some tackle over stuff and put two tight ends on that side or something even if teeter was in the backfield and you have the kind of the the power eye but donovan is the pistol yeah. <laughs> running there so you can even do some triple option out of there with with teeter or if you put sir Roderick instead of teeter in the backfield yeah you, or you, you put sir Roderick as the up back and taj in the back behind i just thought of something better then you're doing some triple option stuff we are forgetting about a Should we just coach the team? <laughs> probably. You and I have forgotten about a 300-pound gentleman who averages Hell yeah. per carry. Yes, Jalen Hutchings. Jalen Hutchings. 40 zone. He, oh, uh, man, I need him in a refrigerator package. So, yeah, he played some running back in high school, and yeah. uh, you've run a couple fake punts with him where they just snapped it to him, and he just yes moved ahead. Uh, I, asked him, there. I asked him last year at the media days if – uh, he was going to get back out there. and He, he said that uh, Wells never gave him the chance. So maybe if we – if we, we need to get that going. We need to find those highlights 
we need to get our uh, scout buddy to send us highlights again of yeah. Forney running back Jalen Hutchings. I yes, one hundred percent. So you could have okay, you could have three tight ends: Teeter, Tharp, and Cup. You could have Hutchings at fullback, Todd yeah. at running back, and yeah. Donovan at quarterback. Yes, you know everybody there is two forty plus. Yeah, you know just I don't know. You you, you can take Unreal. your pick at that point. Unreal. Let's do it. <laughs> and then after you run some just like heavy sets, just running it straight up the gut, you let Jalen Hutchings catch a touchdown. You know he sneaks out into the flat or something. Oh yeah, and you let the big man catch one. Yeah, or it's a read option and. You're crashing the whole line, and Donovan walks in. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm in. Good stuff. I'm so in for that. What are we calling that package? Beef. Um, beef. <laughs> 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 I mean, I think Donovan would be the thinnest guy out there at at six five, two thirty five. I mean, Taj is pretty thick, right? Well, yeah. I mean, I guess five ten, two twenty. Yeah, he's on him at 6'5", 245. Yeah. <laughs> Jeez. Oh, God, I hope we have a lot of first and goal oh, this season. Oh, my God, I want that to happen so bad. Can we, like, DM Kitley? He, he follows like, us, he, maybe. Hey, here's what we're thinking, Kitley. Hey, here's a suggestion, man. <laughs> you so draw, you it can... on a nap- draw it on a napkin. <laughs> <laughs> Take a picture. I, I'm going to DM, DM him this idea for content and see if he responds. Let let's draw. I'll draw it out. I'll draw it out using uh. Okay. I'll like put the names in there, like the so, depth chart clipboard. So is that twenty three personnel, two backs, three tight ends? Yeah. Okay. So we put well, are we putting Sir Roderick as the up. Oh no, we're putting Jalen Hutchings. Yeah. Yeah, Taj and Jalen Hutchings with tail, tailback yeah. and back. Yeah. Yeah. Twenty three personnel. Shout out to the twenty three yeah. personnel. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm gonna. Yeah, three you draw it up, ends. and then we'll we'll DM Kitley and. <laughs> Like, hey man, I know you're probably brainstorming some stuff over the off season, trying to install some packages. We're just gonna just, throw this out there. We just tweet it and tag him. You need to legit DM him. We'll see. Yeah, we'll oh see. man! All right, so we got the Lubbock Matadors in, in the Cardinal Sports Center studio. The first of our lenders is keeping the Pac-12 afloat, uh, even though I doubt that he wants to. But you know, it's not that they want to; it's that they do. They're at diversifiedlenders.com. Uh, Red Raider owned and operated. Um, Code Ninjas. Rahino. Rahino. Our favorite law firm. We don't want to call them. But if we do. But we can if we need to. All right. Any final thoughts? Um, no, we'll have more lists out this week. Uh, I'll just go ahead and give everybody a preview. We're doing the best from every school in their history. Quarterback Monday, running back Tuesday, then wide receiver Tight end slash fullback and kicker. In in school history or in Big 12 history? In school history. So, like, the best quarterback from every Big 12 school, the best running back from every Big 12 school, and so on. Ever? Yeah. Okay. Was that pretty hard for you? or? Um, some of them were, yeah. Yeah. Because some guys had better careers, but they didn't yeah. have a single season that matched up to another guy. So, Or, like, you know, quarterback at OU. You got yeah. Sam Bradford, Jason White – Baker Mayfield and Kyler Murray all won Heisman trophies. Uh, or did Jason, did Jason one. White win one? Yeah, I think so. He was the only. It was either him or Heupel, the first, the only yeah. quarterback to ever win the Heisman and not be drafted. Yeah, I can't remember which one that was. I think it was our, our OU correspondent, David Collier. Yeah, correct. Me. Uh, no, Brett Bomar. Brett Bomar. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Same with like um. Wide receiver, Texas, Texas at a lot running of backs. Yeah, or like, Texas how do you choose between backs. Des Bryant and Justin Blackman? Or yeah, well, I already chose earlier. Yeah, but that's that's tough. Yeah, uh, same with quarterback Mason Rudolph or Brandon Whedon. I know Brandon Whedon's a little bit of a punchline from his NFL times, but you look at his college stats. Yeah, you going Graham Harrell? Yeah, I went Harrell for yeah for college. Me too. Uh, he just had the longevity and all that. The wins. Well, I can't wait. Um, I also am going to love if you put a recent guy. Uh, man, you don't remember this guy? Can I speak to that for just a second? Because you do the list, but I, I just want to speak to something real quick. Sure. If your best player is from 1985 ever, what have you been doing for 30 years? 
Like, don't you want your best players in 2014 or so- later? Like, if your best player is from 2020, so be it. That means you were good recently. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, and it's like here's another thing. You know, if you're if you're Texas, okay, you won a national championship in 2005. Yeah, you won a Heisman Trophy in '98. Ricky. Prior to that, you hadn't done either since the '70s. Right. So, like, you can call it a recency bias, but like. What else have you done in the last 50 years besides those two? Yeah. So, like, if I name VY the best quarterback and Ricky Williams the best running back from your school, like, yeah, Earl Campbell was also great. And I might list Earl Campbell. I don't even remember who I picked. But it's like, yeah, I can't – it can't be YA Tittle for all these, yeah. like, from 1932. Sammy Ball. Every TCU yeah. answer is Sammy Ball. <laughs> And um, like, let's face it. Look, I have tons of respect for Gabe Rivera, EJ Holub, but to go all the way back to the fifties and the strength and conditioning leaps and bounds that have been made since then. Yes. Like, yeah. I'm sorry. The players are bigger, faster, stronger than they even ever from were. The, even from the eighties. Yeah. Yeah. I'd agree with that. I mean, you have some freaks like Deion Sanders and, and guys like that, but right. otherwise, I mean, the, the college running back, or linebacker today versus 25 years ago is just different. It is. Yeah. I just always think it's funny. That's like, how, how many tight ends? What are you 12, man? <laughs> how many hall of fame tight ends can you name besides Mike Ditka from before Tony Gonzalez? Uh, Kellen Winslow. Okay. Senior. Senior. <laughs> certainly. Certainly not, <laughs> not junior. junior. <laughs> Uh, to be like, oh, recency bias, Travis Kelsey. Like, well, yeah. he's Kel- broken Kellen- every NFL record. Yeah, Kellen Winslow Sr. exposed linebackers. Uh, Kellen Winslow Jr. exposed other things. Yeah, so, like, Travis Kelsey, Antonio Gates. Um, yeah. I know I'm missing uh, Tony Gonzalez. Gronk, George Kittle. George Kittle. Like, yeah. sorry, they're all top 10 all time. And I know that they yeah, all 100%. just got done playing or are still playing, but, like, Sorry, that position is crazy now. Like, you didn't well, have... What, what, what's your quarterback? Greg Olson. Ranking? Greg Olson. Like, nah, he, I don't know if I'd put him all time. But... He's a top 15 linebacker all time, I would say. Or uh, top end. 15 tight end all time. But you're also looking at quarterbacks right now. Brady, Manning, Breeze are yeah. probably the top three, and they all just either part just of that, retired or are still playing. Part of that is because they don't throw the ball 12 times a game like they well, used to. In the era, for but, sure. But But, yeah, I mean, like... You put on these highlights, okay, like show me Johnny Unitas and what throw was he making that Aaron Rodgers was just not capable of making? Yeah. Like, c- come on. Yeah. Like, I've, I've seen highlights of Bob Cousy. And sorry, James Harden is better. Why is like they always hammering on Bob Cousy? They could barely dribble back then. I mean, like, it's embarrassing. All right. Like, James. oh, y'all don't right, know about JJ Reddick. <laughs> just saying. Is he a plumber? <laughs> oh, my gosh. They're going to be talking about LeBron like that in 20 years. Be like, yeah, the guys yeah. LeBron was playing against a bunch of school janitors. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I can't wait. Anyway, no, that that's my final thought, I guess. Lists. We'll do more uh, start bench cuts. And we'll do some gauchos after dark rewatches of Big 12 Classics. And, hey, the Matadors are over, so it's officially off season. Are you, uh, are you muted there? Just trying to see if we had any other questions from the Discord. Sorry about that. We don't, but if you want to join the Discord, $5 a month, subscribe on Patreon. Uh, the link is on our Twitter, patreon.com slash gambling gauchos. We've got interviews with Sonny Cumbie, Matt Mooney, Fardaz Amac, Cody Campbell, who's given us a sneak peek of the whatever they're going to announce for the South End Zone project tomorrow. Um, Access to the Discord server, early access to all of our public episodes, and a share of all proceeds go to the Matador Club. So join us for $5 a month on Patreon. Final thought from me. I'm effing pumped for the South End Zone. That video was amazing. I think they said Patrick Clancy made it. Shout out, Patrick Clancy. Do you have any predictions for the South End Zone, or maybe I should say it like this: Do you have any like things you want to see for sure? I've got two predictions slash that I want to see. Okay, there will be some sort of sky bridge 
from the facility to the south end zone and then onto the field. Heck yeah. Or if not, for the players to go down onto the field, it'll be like for administration so they can office out of either building. Uh, prediction number two. So uh, I think those two projects are going to be tied in together. Uh, prediction number two is that there's going to be some kind of retail component. So there will be a restaurant or a hotel or office space available for rent in the South end zone, like kind of attached to the suites or something like that. I am with you that there will be um, an upgraded restaurant array inside of the Jones. You're not with the uh, Skybridge idea. Love the Skybridge idea. I just meant like I don't I don't maybe see a hotel in the South End Zone, but uh, office space, retail space, yeah, I, I'm I'm in with that. Think about this, Rob. If you're a donor who's going to buy a suite in that South End Zone, wouldn't it be right. nice to just have a hotel overlooking the field right there? Yeah, but I mean, if you have the, I just don't know that there's space right there. What do you think they're going to do with the Double T scoreboard. Is that staying? No. It's gone to that some bitch now. I think they should, if they want to move that. It will be repurposed. I think they should move it to the baseball field. Ooh. For, for whatever they do with Dan Law, that could be part of it. Put the double T scoreboard in the student section outfield berm. There you go. Let's go. But All right. th- there was an article about that a few years ago. Yeah. All kinds of problems. Like when it rains, they it's have to full redo of concrete. The, yeah. Yeah. I, so I don't know. Maybe it's time to just tear it down. I, I love that scoreboard, but and I know people are sentimental both ways on it, but anyway. Uh final question from the Discord. If you are banned from Texas, <laughs> uh five candidates of places you'd move to. First off, I wonder what would ever get me banned from Texas. But uh, I don't know. <laughs> So I would say somewhere in Florida, somewhere in Arizona. Florida's a big state. You're you're talking like Orlando? Sure. Miami? Let's go Orlando. Beach. Orlando Beach, or Tampa? Florida? Okay. No, no. Orlando or Tampa. Okay. Um Arizona. I like Tucson. Love Arizona. Underrated. Catch, catch me in Tucson. Arizona's underrated. I'd rather be hot than cold. For sure. Uh, the other one would probably be like Rio Dosa. I just wanted to live a life of obscurity in the cabin. Retire, retire to Rio Dosa. Get back to West Texas. Am I banned from living here or can I never set foot in Texas again? I, this is from Briggsy. He says, uh, if you're banned from Texas. Okay. Um, so that's four. How about like Australia? This cost of living, you know, they speak English down there, similar climate, just opposite winter yeah. and summer. Lots of uh, wildlife that I'm, that might not be into. Or um costa rica i think a lot of americans retire down there i was gonna say puerto rico maybe that's Same what thing. i'm thinking of one or the other oh puerto rico is uh american territory yeah but i think a lot of people uh, in costa rica speak english and... no no like san diego uh if cost of living was out the window sure i love san diego yeah i would want to live in california but oceanside uh, south of south of yeah. san diego there's a there's a place off uh, Ocean Avenue. Yeah, where I used to sit and talk with you. Yeah, go on. We were both sixteen, and it felt so right sleeping all day, staying up all night. night. Yeah, I got it. <laughs> yeah, San Diego's beautiful. Schedule San Diego State home and home in the non-con. If if we're gonna be in the pack 18 or whatever it is, the big pack 18, you need to have a presence in the West. So go to San Diego every other year. Fans will go, go to Vegas, play UNLV and San Diego state home and home. So you go to one of those cities every year while the other one's in Lubbock. And then the third one, you know, an in-state uh, North Texas or SMU or whoever, Texas state, something like that. That's my non-con schedule moving forward. I'm in. Uh, Greg Swaim has retweeted his newspaper tweet. Oh, God. So look for some uh, newspaper news in the next couple of days. 
Someone go get the Tempe newspaper and tell me if Arizona State's coming to the pack or the Big 12. Extra, extra expansion in the Big 12. <laughs> uh, this is a long episode, man. Uh, one more. Sorry. Okay. Uh, report Pac-12 using UCF, Cincinnati, BYU, Houston against the Big 12 in negotiations. I just thought you would like that. I because you you knew that was coming. Hey, yeah, that's what happens when you uh, when you merge with Conference USA. You know your your brand takes the American, the American Athletic. Whatever. I'm I'm trying to be derogatory. So says the guy the says USA. the guy who wanted uh, New Mexico in his dream <laughs> conference. <laughs> hey, tough but fair. All right, I'm done. All right, me too. Love y'all.